Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, March 20th, we're studying Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14. Upon leaving the temple with his disciples, Jesus speaks startling words concerning the temple's destruction. And when he is questioned further by his disciples, he begins his fifth and final discourse in the Gospel of Matthew. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us a regular guest, Pastor Sean Kilgo. Pastor Kilgo serves the Northeast Kansas Lutheran Partnership. Pastor Kilgo, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Hey, it's good to be back. Thanks. Pastor Kilgo, as we get started, I think there's plenty of context to talk about <clears throat> and just introducing this, uh, this discourse in general. Give us the context surrounding uh, Matthew 24. Where, where have we been that we need to know going into the text today? Yeah, so, so the main thing is that, uh, to remember, we are in Holy Week. I, I think this actually kind of gets lost. Um, I think a lot of times when we're reading the Gospels, um, especially a Gospel like um, like Matthew or John, that they end up spending so much of their Gospel in that in that time period. Um, uh, and and they all do, but I think probably Matthew and, and John, John definitely the most. But we're in uh, currently Tuesday of Holy Week, right? And so Jesus has already come in on the triumphal entry. He's been uh, confronting the, the Pharisees. He's um, had a, a whole slew of, of parables and whatnot that he's that he's taught. Um, and uh, now he's he's nearing the very end of this, and this is kind of this transitionary spot in Matthew. Like you mentioned, there's these, these five discourses, and this is the last one. This is the... Um, Called the eschatological discourse, or the or the discourse dealing with the um, the end of things, or the, the the consummation of things, and um, uh, and so this presses us then into uh, what we normally think of when we think of Holy Week, and that's going to be the the preparation of the Passover and and all these sorts of things. But that's that's still uh, two days away from right now. So you mentioned the the title of the discourse, the eschatological discourse. I think I've sometimes heard it called the Olivet Discourse, given the the place from which Jesus will will give it as well. What what should we know about right. this this discourse as a whole that we're starting today? Yeah. So so the main thing that's going on in here is that that Jesus is unpacking. So this is uh, Matthew twenty four one to Matthew twenty six one is what's considered this section of the discourse. And this is preparing the disciples and the hearer of the gospel then for what's going to take place in the, uh, in the Lord's passion that occurs uh, I- immediately after this. So you, you get um, uh, at the very beginning of chapter 26 in Matthew, um, that's when you go into the betrayal, right? And that, that begins the, the passion of, of our Lord in Matthew. So, so this whole section is uh, preparing us for that in, in a couple of ways, because the disciples are, and we'll get into this, but, but the disciples are, are asking two particular questions uh, that, that Jesus is, is answering in, in a, uh, it, honestly, in a difficult way. It, it, it's difficult to kind of figure out what's going on where in Jesus' answer, but it's dealing with... Um, uh, the consummation of things, and I and I've started using that language, um, uh, probably influenced by by Doctor Gibbs and his commentary, uh, because it's the uh, this idea of the the fulfillment of things, and there's kind of two things going on here. There's the we have in view the last day that uh, when our Lord Jesus returns, um, but we also have the consummation of everything in our Lord's passion, his death and his resurrection. Um, and then you have in here the destruction of the temple too. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of things that are going on, but it's all pressing toward um, preparing the disciples and the, and the hearers of the gospel for Christ's death. 
So the disciples are, and maybe this is getting, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves before we read the text, but, but the disciples are going to ask two questions, particularly about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and about Christ's return. But you're, you're saying that in all of it, what Jesus is, is ultimately doing for his disciples is preparing them for the events of the next several days so that they have a, a framework to view his, his passion, his death, and, and I would say also his resurrection? Yeah, I mean, so you, you know, you'll notice, like, in, in all of this, like, how often uh, Jesus is talking about um, uh, his, his coming back, um, dealing with false teachers, and all these things, and these are things that, I, I would say, in, in most of this, the, the primary thing in view is the last day, but it's, it's paralleling with Jesus' death and resurrection, too, right? So the disciples are having to deal with um, with the false teachers of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and whatnot, all throughout this, um, they're being exhorted to uh, to stay awake. I mean, there's a section we won't have it, but one of the, the later uh, episodes will have this, where there's this big section where Jesus is like really emphatic on on staying awake. Um, and then you fast forward into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus has that a spot where he's he's praying and he keeps coming back to the disciples and he's like hey stay awake can and, and it's kind of like uh, if if you are reading straight through and this is the problem of reading in chunks right if you read this straight through it's only been um a couple of chapters or one chapter i think um since uh since jesus is given that exhortation and it's only been a few hours, in fact, since Jesus has given that exhortation as far as the timeline is concerned. And so there, there's, there is definitely the eschatological, the end time view uh, of all of this. And we should keep that in front of our faces. But also that there's uh, our Lord's death going on here as well. Right. And, and that's a little, a little harder to see sometimes. And it's not always necessarily there, but it is. Um, definitely pressing towards that. Right. So so that as we read through chapter 24 and 25, we're going to see, and maybe we should be looking for, those parallels that we'll notice coming up in chapters 26 and 27 to what happens to our Lord in his passion and his death. Good. Let's let's go ahead and read the text, then, and, and I think that's going to lead us into even more sort of introductory questions here. So this is Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That's the text for today, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14. So, Pastor Kilgo, again, you reminded us at the beginning, we are in Holy Week here. Jesus has gone back and forth during Holy Week. He entered in on Palm Sunday. He left, spends the night in Bethany, comes back on Holy Monday. He's going back and forth. This, you said this is Holy Tuesday now, and he's leaving right. the temple. So, I mean, right. this seems like a pretty significant action here. Jesus leaves the temple, and then he, he says even more shocking words, at least to the disciples' ear. What's the significance of those first two verses of the text? Yeah, so um, so you have, and this is what kind of marks this as the uh, the beginning of the discourse, is this leaving of the temple. Um, we remember, too, that, that Jesus has uh, recently come back, and he's, 
uh, he's cleansed the temple as well, right? Um, but uh, this this idea of the so we should remember up until this point that the Lord's promise uh, to be with His people is tied to the physical location of the temple, right? So so you you've got to come to the temple in Jerusalem for for the major festivals and whatnot. That's why you know during during Holy Week, this being a major uh, festival week, it, the place is packed, right? Um, because it's uh, one of the three major festivals that you have these pilgrimages into Jerusalem for. And the reason why they've got to do that is because this is the Lord has attached His promise particularly to this place, right? So for for Jesus, th- this idea of leaving the temple, right? We shouldn't hear this as just like. Um, uh, Jesus is just kind of walking down the road, but this this idea that he's kind of leaving it behind now, um, and uh, uh, I mean the language of Matthew is is pretty stark. It's like a temple's gone, right? Uh, and then uh, as the disciples try and like say, "Hey, look, this is pretty awesome buildings," don't you think, Jesus? And he's like, "Well, yeah, it's all going to be torn down." Um, and uh, and this is a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem in in 70 AD, um, it's, it's, uh, 10, uh, August 70 AD. And I only remember that because that's my anniversary, which is a great day to have an anniversary on. Um, but, uh, it, uh, if, if for the listener, if you want to read on this, go read Josephus on the destruction of Jerusalem. It's really a, a phenomenal sort of thing, but, uh, there's these, these giant blocks and it's all torn down, but, but even more striking, like we think of this as, you know, this kind of tragedy of the destruction of a, of a building. But we, we have to remember God's promise is attached to that. So for the building to be destroyed um, is to say that you, you can't come to where God has promised. Now, normally that would be a, a major issue. But we remember kind of paralleling with this in the uh, Passion, when, when Christ dies, the temple veil is torn from top to bottom. Right. And this is this uh, signifying that the the access to God is now opened beyond the temple in Jerusalem uh, for all peoples. Right. And this is going to be something that's uh, a thing that's going to come up right at the end of our text, too. Um, so. So, yes, it's it's shocking for the disciples, but it actually is this this really wonderful bit of gospel that's in here. It doesn't sound like it at first, but when you when you tie this in with what happens later, when you know what the end of the story is, um, it really is quite wonderful because now we don't have to go to Jerusalem in order to receive the Lord's uh, uh, mercy. Uh, we get it, you know, here in Kansas and down there for you in Texas and all and all over the world that this has been opened up uh, because now the the Lord has ascended and fills all things with Himself. So. Yeah, there's a new temple now. I, I, the connection that you made to, to Matthew 21 had been going through my mind, too, where Jesus he's, he enters into Jerusalem, and the first place he goes is the temple, and he throws out the money changers, to, decries the fact that it's become a den of robbers rather than a house of prayer. And, and I, was, I was thinking through, we, taking your, the, the text from Matthew 21 to that event, now to here, it's almost as if here's here's the, the completion of that that cleansing of the temple that that went on in Matthew chapter 21 but then you brought out actually really the co- the full completion of that event happens in Matthew chapter 27 when Jesus dies right. when he makes the the once and final sacrifice and and there there the the new temple is is fully established in his body i think of the the words that Jesus speaks in John chapter 2 where he's talking about he tells them you destroy this temple and i'll raise it up in 3 days <laughs> And, and that's what he's talking about is that fulfillment coming up in just a couple of days. So again, I mean, that, and I think that's a, just a wonderful reminder to take us back to what you said at the beginning, that, that all of this is pointing us forward to Holy Week and, and especially to Jesus' death on the cross. The, these words about the destruction of this building, the temple, are really preparing Jesus' disciples to, at some point, right, maybe it doesn't happen until Pentecost, but, but to recognize that the, the new temple, the place where you have access to God now, is not a building, but it's in this person, Jesus Christ. Right. Well, and I, w- and I would say um, we ought to look back in, in history and, and see the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD as kind of this um, uh, 
fulfillment basically of of what happens or not fulfillment but um further showing forth by god of what he does when he tears the veil open um that this isn't the place that you have to go now right um that this is this is all over the place and so um the unfortunately the the building itself has to be destroyed in order to kind of get that through to us sometimes um but there's also this this nice thing i I was thinking about this uh previously you know we we get very very attached to our buildings um and i and i understand that um i love our our church buildings um but we should remember that the building itself is not the um where the promise is found it's it's in the words of of our lord that we have the promises now we we've, we've set aside we've consecrated these places for those those promises to be delivered to people um but even if our and I'm looking at one of our churches right now even if god forbid uh you know something happened to this building and burns up or something like that and gets uh torn down uh the lord's promises are not bound to that building right they're bound to his word and so wherever god's word is there's there's his promises and this is a really marvelous thing that it kind of comes out of this also right yeah and and looking forward into this discourse and we'll get to this text on on monday's show but the the end of the section and i know we haven't talked about what's talking about jerusalem what's talking about the end but but the end of the section where where Jesus definitely makes a shift and he's certainly talking about the end times right before that you get in verse 35 heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away uh, uh, hearkening back to what's happening here that yes this building will be destroyed but the the certainty the foundation will not because that certainty is is the words of of our Lord Jesus Christ and and not to but i mean i, I imagine this is on the mind of many Christians right now who may be hearing the word of god this sunday not in their church building and and i think that's a, a right. very comforting reminder today yeah well and I, and this is uh you know across the world right um that that the lord's word um is not bound to a place right the the lord's word is um has been given uh, free course. We actually have this. This is one of the the collects at the at the end of the service that that your word would not be bound, but have free course among us, right? Um, and this is uh, really, I mean, God, God be. I I don't always praise technology, but God be praised that He's given us the technology now that we can, in the midst of kind of the, the pandemic that's going on internationally, that the that the Lord's word can continue to be proclaimed in a pretty profound sort of way. Um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't permanently take the place of the gathering, right? The scriptures are pretty clear on, uh, on gathering for these things. But, but the point is, right, that it, uh, as long as you have the Lord's word, you have all of his promises that come along with that, right? Now, some of those promises need, need to be in person, like baptism, Lord's Supper, um, I would say absolution. Uh, some people might disagree with me on that, but certainly baptism and in Lord's Supper, you can't do that through a screen. So, so there's still a, a, um, a temporal, uh, nature to this. It's not just kind of floating out in the nether sphere. Um, but it's still, you know, we can walk out into the backyard and have, uh, have the Lord's Supper if that's the only place that we have to do it. Right. So, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter the location any longer. And that's the point. Right, right, because because even those those means that we use, the water, the bread, the wine, the reason that those are the means we use and that they are effective is not because of those things in and of themselves, but because, as you've been pointing out, the Word is what is attached to them. The, the Catechism makes these things plain for us as, as we confess them as Christians, that the baptism is effective because the Word is attached, and, and the Lord's Supper is effective because the Word is attached. So it keeps coming back to the Word. And and that's that's going to be the foundation. So, Pastor Kilgo, we're we're coming. We've still got a few minutes here before the break, and I think that'd be a, a good way to to close this section out. Is is to talk a little bit about the setting now that Jesus is going to to address 
begin his his discourse, the Mount of Olives, and and start thinking about these two questions that that the disciples ask. So so Jesus again, just a reminder, right? He's left the temple. He's made this shocking pronouncement to his disciples, who who have all their lives attached God's presence to this building. He said that building's going to be gone. And, and naturally, they're going to ask him about this. So so first, tell us a little about the setting, Pastor Kilgo. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives as he begins his discourse. Where what's Why is that significant? Yeah, so so this is where Jesus tends to go and, and pray and teach the disciples kind of privately. Um, the Mount of Olives is between um, uh, Bethany and Jerusalem. But so I think we have in our minds these like, big giant distances, and that's not the case. Um, As the crow flies, uh, the Mount of Olives and the temple are about a mile apart. Uh, Now that you've got to go through the Kidron Valley, so so it's a little bit longer on foot, but you go down down the Mount of Olives, through the Kidron Valley, and then up uh, the the side of the uh, hill to to go up to to the temple in Jerusalem. This is part of the reason why Jerusalem's always up. It's always up to the temple. Um, there's also a theological reason, but it's also, it's up on a hill. Um, so, uh, from Beth, from, um, well, from Bethany too, but from the Mount of Olives, if you're sitting on the Mount of Olives, you can look across the Kidron Valley, you can see the temple. Um, and I think this is significant because, you know, one, it's just, a, you know, maybe a mile and a half by foot. So they're walking along. It doesn't take very long to get there. So there's not a lot that necessarily would have been said in this time frame. Uh, but they they get there, and you can imagine the disciples are just kind of still looking back, and they're looking at the temple and thinking about what Jesus says. Um, and now they're in, at the Mount of Olives, and they're like, "Hey, Jesus, um, what are you talking about? We, we, we don't get it." And and so that's that's where they're at. But they can they can still see the temple and all the buildings of Jerusalem. And I think we should have that picture in our mind um, as as we think about what Jesus is saying, because all of this, all of this is taught from the Mount of Olives. It's not until um, uh, the Passover that they go back. Um, This is also why it's not that big of a deal that Jesus is going back and forth every single day with his disciples, because it's only a mile or two walk. Right, right. The the parsonage isn't very far from Jerusalem, I guess you could say. So, right, right. So, so, Pastor Kilgo, then they're, they're on the Mount of Olives, and, and they're still looking at the temple. And I, I like that image of they're leaving Jerusalem, and they're just kind of glancing back because of these shocking words that are still in their mind that Jesus has said. And so they're going to ask him. And, and in so asking, they ask him two questions. They say, first, when will these things be, right? When the things that you've just told us about the throwing down of one stone and, and another, when will those things happen? And then question number two is, what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? So, I mean, I think that brings up a couple things to, to talk about. Well, as, as we're going to get into Jesus' answer, we're going to try to see, are, is he answering one or the other or both? For the disciples, do they think that this is going to be a connected answer for Jesus is a connected answer? Start, help us to start sorting out some of these issues. Yeah, so I think this is a really good point to, to, to emphasize. There are two questions here. It's really easy to read this as only one question, but there are two distinct questions. When will these things be is referring to the destruction of the temple itself. And then, for whatever reason, and this is weird because Jesus has not talked about this, and the, the word that they use, Jesus has not used anywhere in Matthew up to this point. It's, it's parousia. Um, it's not... Um, it's not the normal word for like he, he came from Bethany or something like that. Um, uh, it's this word parousia, which a lot of times will actually just get transliterated as that. What will be the sign of your coming and, and of the end of the age? So they ask, uh, when is the temple going to be torn down and what's going to be the sign when you come back? Or when you, I want to stay away from, from the, the language of coming back. I, the, the more I think about this, the more I think that's part of the confusion here. Um, is that the disciples maybe are not actually asking when is Jesus return on the last day going to be, but rather kind of this, this kind of fuller understanding of this word parousia. Um, and the end of the age is the consummation. 
that's that word I've used earlier, the, the kind of fulfillment, it has in it the word telos, uh, right, which is the the word that Jesus speaks uh, from the cross, it is finished, right? So, um, I mean, that's in John, but we can, we can pull that in here a little bit. But there are two distinct questions, and this is where it gets really confusing, is what question Jesus is answering when as, as we go through this. And there's some general thoughts on this. The, you know, one of the general thoughts is chapter 24, um, 4 through, uh, what is it, like, uh, I, I think normally, as, I, as this, I'm looking forward, yeah, normally 35, uh, 36 is, is where a lot of people would put sort of a, a hinge where there, it seems there's a pretty key break. Um, right. But yeah, so like four through 35, the question that's, that we're going to say there is, is that only about Jerusalem? Is, is there right. some? That, that's right. the question. And, and I don't think it's only about Jerusalem. I, I, think, there, I think that that's kind of narrow on this. I think that there is, there is a lot that is going on in here. And if it's only about Jerusalem, um, that it's, it's kind of weird in, in some places. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. And just, I mean, just to, and this uh, will, again, we'll get to this, this text next week. Verse 36 is, is a definitely a turning point within this discourse where Jesus is going yes. to say, but concerning that day and hour, <laughs> No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only, such that Jesus gives a very definitive answer there to the second question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Jesus says, nobody knows when it is, so stay awake. Don't be looking for signs, but watch. Be ready always. Right. So, I mean, and, and that answer is going to be key for us regardless of of whether we're going to see 4 through 35 as only Jerusalem or some sort of, of mixture or maybe a, an overlap within those verses of, of the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the end of the age, that we're going to need to keep verse 36 in mind, that if we're going to take any of, of verses 4 through 35 as speaking of the end of the age, then we need to make sure not in the sense that we're looking for a sign so that we can know the day, but, but rather just as right. a reminder, hey, it is coming, be ready. And, and right now, the break is coming, be ready. So you're listening to Sharper Iron here on Worldwide KFU. We're going to take that short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that for over 40 years, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries with low-cost loans and resources? This is Rahema Kavuga, Synod Relations Manager of Lutheran Church Extension Fund. Because of faithful investors like you, we've been able to help church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations. To learn how you can get involved, call 800-843-8233. Some music of the church is meant only for certain seasons of the year. Other music moves easily from season to season. You can hear and enjoy both kinds on the next episode of Sing for Joy. Do join us. Sundays at noon on KFUO, the messenger of good news. Tomorrow's Law and Gospel is normally an open mic Law and Gospel. We will not be in the studio, but I do have some emails. And if you would like to send me an email that I'll respond to, do it at Law and Gospel at lawandgospel101.com. And we'll be looking forward to having you hear us on tomorrow's Law and Gospel. Listen to Law and Gospel weekday mornings beginning at 930 on KFUO. 
Welcome back to Sharper Iron on this Friday, March 20th. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14, with Pastor Sean Kilgo of the Northeast Kansas Lutheran Partnership. Pastor Kilgo, prior to the break, we, we were still introducing this, this Olivet Discourse, this eschatological discourse that Jesus gives here in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and we were, we were addressing the, the twin question, the two separate questions that the disciples ask. When will the destruction of Jerusalem be, and what's going to be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? And we were, we're wrestling a little bit with that second one, particularly, and how much it's going to apply to verses 4 through 35 of, of chapter 24. We kind of got, we, we ran up against that break, and I kind of cut you off a bit. Do you have any further thoughts on, on how that question, is it being answered? What, what are we seeing, in the, especially in that first section? Yeah, so, so let me give you an example of where, where I think it, putting, putting a hard break there at, at 30, uh, 36 uh, can be troublesome. So it, um, and we won't talk about this, but just to give the example, uh, 29 to, to 31, right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then it will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then, and then, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming, that's Perusia, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So what's that? <laughs> what is that talking about? I mean, is that, um, is that answering still this, this first question? Uh, when will these things be? I mean, that's kind of a weird sort of thing but it sort of is um in in this in this weird i mean you have the, the language of the, the sun being darkened and all this so i mean the, my point is that um you, you got to kind of go spot by spot and at the end of the day we are dealing with the the last day uh in in a lot of this we are dealing with some some a very weighty topic just overall um and it's it's confusing. It's not entirely clear in a lot of places. And we should be okay with just kind of putting our hands up and saying, "I'm not really sure what's what's going on here and what exactly is being being talked about." I, I think that that a lot of times, especially when we're dealing with eschatological stuff, is the the safer thing to do. Uh, because this is where a lot of church bodies will get themselves, and, and Christians in general will get themselves into trouble, um, is trying to kind of pinpoint a lot of stuff in here and, and make kind of definitive statements on certain things. When the the honest answer is this is a really, really tough section to, to try and figure out what's going on. Right. It, it definitely <laughs> is. One of the ways that I, I try to hold these things together is to is to think about verses— four through thirty five as as talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. But that as Jesus so that everything that's there you can you can apply to the destruction of Jerusalem. And and you know you brought up some of the some of the more difficult texts in doing this, especially do come in what we'll look at on Monday. So I encourage everybody to, to, to listen to that because there that's where we're going to wrestle with some of that stuff. But that you can you can see application of all of verses four through thirty five to the destruction of Jerusalem. But, but in right. my mind, I also see that as Jesus is doing that, he's giving us a picture, uh, or in miniature maybe, or a glimpse of what will also be true of the time before the end. And again, keeping verse 36 as yes. a key, that not, we're, not in the sense that we're going to be able to pinpoint a date, but rather we would recognize that it's coming. So that these events, and, and we'll talk about some of them here in just a moment in the text for today— are, are a rem the, that happened, they did happen before 70 AD. So these, these famines, earthquakes, etc., happened before 70 AD. But, but in that small picture, it just, I, I can't, as you point out, I just, I can't help but escape, I can't escape thinking that Jesus is also showing us a glimpse of things that will continue to happen before his, right. his uh, we don't want to say his return, before the consummation on, on the last day. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to come back to this a little bit on this, um, what will be the, the sign of your coming? And um, uh, Dr. Gibbs mentions this, that, that 
when the disciples come to Jesus, especially privately, to ask him questions, they're they're always kind of wrongheaded in some way. They're they're confused or they've got ulterior motives or something's going on, right? And so I think we should come at this from that perspective a little bit, and especially with this word showing up, parousia, because um, this could very well have the implication of the disciples actually asking. So, so Jesus does this all the time, right? Someone will ask a question and Jesus answers a different question. What the, what the question is they should have asked, right? And, and I think that actually maybe is what's going on here in this questioning, that the disciples are coming up and they are asking, what's going to be the sign of your, uh, your parousia, your, your kind of unveiling yourself, that this Jesus that we know that nobody else seems to know. We know who, who you are because you've revealed it to yourself. Um, uh, what's going to be the sign of you doing that for everybody? Right. Um, and in that sense, that actually has maybe a better connection to the destruction of the temple, especially if the disciples have made the connection as others have um, that the destruction of the temple is also the destruction of Jesus' body. Right. So, um, so if we make that kind of connection that there's this kind of wrongheaded question, when are you going to reveal your glory to, uh, to everybody? Um, that kind of helps to make a little bit more sense of how Jesus then is answering this. Cause he's answering a different question. Um, he's answering the, um, when are you, uh, when are you coming? Yeah. When are you coming back? Uh, part of the reason I don't like that that language is it does place into our minds the idea that Jesus isn't here. Right. Um, uh, when is the last day maybe is a, a better question uh, to be more, more precise with it because Jesus is still here. And we have to make that point like every advent, right? Uh, Jesus right. came, he continues to come. He will come again. Right. Um, and that just is a long way of saying Jesus never left. <laughs> so, right. Right. So, uh, so, and just so, yeah, to, I mean, to the point, Go ahead, yeah. go ahead, finish up. So, I mean, I, mean I, I think that that, right or wrong, I mean, it, it is, we should recognize it is a weird word for the disciples to use here, this parousia. Because, uh, like I said, it does not show up until this spot in Matthew, and it is only in this section of Matthew. Right. Um, so that maybe maybe they don't understand exactly what they're asking when they use that word. Similar to the way right. maybe when James and John back in Matthew chapter 20 come and, and through their mom ask, you know, can we sit on your right and your left? And, and Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking for in a, in a similar way. They, they may not realize what they're asking Jesus about when they use this term parousia. And so his answer then is, right. is going to be directed at what they should have asked or what, what the true meaning and understanding of what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's yeah. talk a little bit about the things then that Jesus says in, in the answer that for the part that we've got today verses four sure. through 14. So, so in, in answer to these, the question, these questions, the, the first thing that Jesus brings up and, and again, if we're going to try to connect both the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the end, the last day, the first thing that Jesus brings up is not probably what many people think about when they think about the end. For, for most people, I, I think, uh, this could be wrong, but I think for many people, when they think about the end, they think about the wars, the rumors of wars, all the bad stuff happening around it. But that's not the first thing Jesus brings up to his disciples' mind. The first thing that he brings right. up is, is false teaching. So why is this such a big deal? Yeah, I mean, and this is, this is the larger danger. Right. That, I, I would say that's why it's brought up first. And it is it's something that um, comes up again in in the very next uh, set of verses. It comes up again later. I mean, it's something that Jesus keeps bringing up is the danger of false teaching because uh, false teaching. So, so you look at the other things, uh, wars, um, nation rising up against nation, famines, earthquakes, all these are physical things. Like they, they will harm your body in some way. Um, but if your, if your faith remains, um, at the end of the day, it's not going to be any loss because you will be raised on the last day with a perfect body. So 
this is, you know, when we should hear in our minds, you know, Jesus earlier where he says, um, uh, do not fear those who can only destroy the body, um, but rather fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell, right? So, so don't worry if your body gets, gets damaged. So he brings up first the thing that it's not going to damage your body. It's going to damage you spiritually um, to, to lead you this uh, being led astray, right? Um, which is kind of the, the, the language of, of sheep, right? Uh, which is pretty common. Uh, and then many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Right. So, so that they're going to, they're going to claim either to be Christ and, and the Greek is striking here because this is, uh, he uses the ego a me here. Right. Um, which, which is fascinating to me. It, it's almost like he's saying many will come in my, in my name saying, you know, I am God, the Messiah, <laughs> um, which, which is, which is interesting because on the flip side, it's, it's kind of this kind of nudge in Matthew of who Jesus is. Right, the the real God who is the Messiah, but they're they're going to come in the name of Jesus, right? And they're going to draw people away from Jesus, and th- this is the most dangerous thing to to be separated from from God. Uh, and we should remember that this is what false doctrine always does. False doctrine never draws us to God, but it draws us to the household of the devil. He's the father of lies. Um, he's a murderer, right? This is what he does. Uh, he breathes out lies, as, as Jesus says. And so anytime lies are spoken, it is from the devil, right? And the devil is never doing anything to draw us closer to the Lord, but to bring us further away from him, right? So, so that's the first and the primary danger and the reason why he brings it up over and over and over. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and again, that, that happened both before the fall of Jerusalem, and it does continue right now as, as we await our Lord's uh, parousia, his coming on the last day. The, the next thing that Jesus brings up, he brings up more of these physical signs, but, but even as he brings up these physical signs, which would be otherwise very alarming, very troubling, concerning, perhaps creating things like panic or hysteria. Jesus says, don't be alarmed. The end is not yet. That Those are pretty comforting words, I think, today, Pastor Kogo. Yeah. So so there's, you know, if, if you haven't heard, there's a pandemic going on. Um, and there, there's this great temptation anytime this sort of stuff happens uh, to think that, you know, Jesus is just right around the corner. I mean, he's got to be, right? It's the end of the world, right? Well, Jesus says, it's not. It's not the end of the world. Stop trying to figure out when the end of the world is. Don't be alarmed by these things. And, and the, the problem is, and this is also where false, false teachers come into play, is that false teachers tend to be really good at taking advantage of panic. Uh, so people start freaking out, and they go, and they, they try and find, you know, they, they, they want someone to listen to, and so false teachers will go out there and they'll, they'll scratch their ears. I was just watching some stuff from these uh, various false teachers floating around out there talking about um, kind of taking advantage of the, the coronavirus situation going on and, um, and leading people astray through this. And, um, and this, is, this is where this kind of gets connected again into, into the false teaching. But he's saying – you know, look, all, all of this is going to happen. So uh, kind of paraphrasing Peter in his, uh, in his first epistle, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though something strange were happening. Right? I, it's not a fair phrase, it's just a quote. But, um, you know, don't, Jesus is saying the same thing. Don't be surprised when this sort of stuff happens. Um, and not just wars and rumors of wars, not just famines and earthquakes and stuff, but, but any, anything, um, as he says at the end, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains, right? That this, the, the creation groaning, right, on, on account of the fall into sin. Um, th- this is just the beginning of this stuff. Now, we don't know when the end is. We don't know if the beginning is close to the end or if it's far away from the end. Um, 
and it's not given to us to figure that out. What's given to us is in the midst of this to trust in the Lord and his promises, to, um, to rejoice that, um, as St. Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Um, I, I paraphrase this for, for some people previously that, you know, he says, um, uh, neither death, I'm certain that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. It's like, so, you know, just substitute in there, nor coronavirus or flu or any other pandemic, right? None of these can separate you from Jesus. Trust in that, right? Rejoice in that. Uh, that regardless of what happens, we don't know what's going to happen. That can be scary. We don't know what's going to happen with the, with the pandemic, but we know what's going to happen with Jesus. He's going to continue forgiving sins. He's going to continue guarding us in the faith. He's going to come back for us on the last day and raise us immortal and perishable and, imper- and perfect. Um, and so we trust in that. And because we have that, then we go and we serve our neighbor as we're given to do. And if, if we are alarmed, as Jesus says, at all of this stuff going on, uh, then we, we go into a panic, we start listening to false teachers, our faith is put in jeopardy, and we start acting selfishly and going by and buying all the toilet paper and not loving our neighbor, right? So um, not being alarmed, not going into a panic about this stuff, because we know that it's going to happen and we're not surprised by it, guards us both in faith and in life. And, and and that's really, really important to kind of see, I think, in this in this whole section, right? Yeah, the, these are the beginning of the birth pains, Jesus says. And so, I mean, for his disciples then, prior to 70 AD, as they saw these things taking place, it was an opportunity for them to recall what Jesus had said and to see that his word is true and to put their, their trust in him further. And the same with us today, rather than becoming alarmed and and giving in to, to fear that, that is all around us, but the Lord invites us to, to trust in his word, that, that he has said, this is what life will be like at the end. Cling to me. Don't, don't give in to the false teachers that are going to be around, but cling to me instead. Because look, I've, I've told you these things beforehand. He'll use that again in, in the text that we'll look at um, on Monday going forward. Again, thinking both with the destruction of Jerusalem and for us right now living in these, in these last days before our Lord's return. A return. I I can't stop myself from saying it that way, Pastor Kogo. Um, but yeah, you know no, what I mean. It's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I, I mean, this make everybody self conscious now. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so so Pastor Kogo, then as as the text continues, Jesus then he he goes now for the disciples particularly. Everything that he's he's talked about so far is is maybe for the world at large. The false teachers are going to be attacking the world at large. The wars, the rumors of wars, the famines. This is going to be in the world at large. But, but now, as, as you continue into to verse 9, he's going to speak very specifically about what will happen to his, his church, the tribulation, the persecution. Uh, we've got about six minutes left here on the morning to, to look at verses 9 through 14. Uh, pick out the most important stuff for us. Okay. Well, so, so he's doing the same sort of thing. He's narrowed it down, like you said. It, it's now you, right? Um, many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another, um, but the the language in that is really fascinating. We don't really have time to go into all the words in there, but uh, the fall away is, is the word um, where we get the word schism from, um, or not schism, uh, the scandalize. Um, it's to be like uh, ashamed. So same word um, uh, when, when uh, Jesus foretells Peter's denial that he's going to be, uh, he's going to fall away from him. It's a, this idea of, of uh, being ashamed of, of what's been spoken to you. Right. Um, so, uh, so many will be, be ashamed, betray one another, hate one another. Um, uh, prophets will arise. False prophets will arise and lead many astray. There it is again. Right. Um, and then, so, so this is, again, he's not saying if, but you know, this is just going to happen. Right. He's just telling, telling them. Um, and then the consequence of all this, and, and this is, I think, this is what I was talking about just a minute ago, too. Because lawlessness will be increased, which is uh, uh, sin, right? And remember, St. Saint, Saint Paul says this, uh, uh, sin is lawlessness. Uh, covetousness is lawlessness. Um, uh, uh, will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. And we should hear there uh, that the prophecy to 
St. John uh, with the church in Ephesus, that this is the thing that, that the Lord has against them, that, that um, their, their first love uh, has, has grown cold, right? And, th- and this is the uh, um, not having the love of the neighbor um, as well as not having the love of God, right? Um, so, so I think we should, we should hear that both intern- for, for people internally and externally, that, that my love for the Lord um, has grown cold and my love for my neighbor has grown cold. And this is what happens when our focus becomes all this stuff that, that's going on around us instead of, um, as, as we've had in the gradual, at least in three years recently, uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Right? Um, but then this great gospel at the end, uh, the one who endures to the end will be saved. It's not a might be, but will be. And th- we can hear in this an echoing, or we can hear Paul echoing this when he talks to, like, Timothy and says, um, uh, run the race, uh, keep the faith. Um, uh, that this, this language of, of enduring in the midst of struggle, right, um, uh, that we are given to endure to the end of the world. Now, if that's only up to us, we're, we're doomed, but we know that the Lord sends to us um, the Holy Spirit in order to comfort and strengthen us. This is, especially as we confess it in the third article, um, uh, that the Holy Spirit in the same way um, uh, uh, keeps me in the one true faith, right? That it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to keep me here. Uh, and so we can rejoice that, that the Lord does that. Uh, again, through his word and his, his sacraments. And then, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, right? Now, there, there's a lot to be said, but this this bit of comfort for us, that I think in America, we like to think of ourselves as the center of everything. So we always think about how we need to be sending the, the gospel out to all nations. Yeah, we, we should be sending missionaries out. We should be doing missions work. But we should remember the fact that I'm here in Kansas and you're there in Texas uh, talking about the Lord's word and rejoicing in the gospel is evidence in and of itself that this has already been happening, right? Because we're not in Jerusalem. Uh, somehow the gospel has made its way across the ocean and, you know, into the middle of the United States. And, and here we are a couple thousand years later talking about it and rejoicing in it. Um, and then even more than that, you know, we have, you know, a, a wonderful gift like KFUO and all these other radio programs that are broadcasting this internationally and supporting the, the work of the spread of the gospel, um, as well as now, like we mentioned at the beginning, all of this online stuff that's going on. Uh, so we, we should hear in this, um, uh, n- secondarily, a a call to go out and and continue speaking the gospel to the world, but a a comfort that it has happened, um, and and we sitting here right now are evidence of that, and we should rejoice in that, um, and that should be our our first, I think, thought when we when we come across this sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Once once again, the Lord has has proved that His Word is true. He has fulfilled what He has spoken. That we can continue to trust to Him as we await His coming on the last day. Pastor Sean Kilgo serves at the Northeast Kansas Lutheran Partnership, helping us this morning with Matthew chapter twenty four verses one through fourteen. Pastor Kilgo, thank you for your time today. Thank you. The Lord answers his disciples' questions in their fear and their confusion. He points them to the sure and certain word of his, that foundation that will never pass away. That's the foundation that we have today in the midst of fear and panic. Our Lord's word will never pass away, and in him neither will we. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.